I would like to reflect on this first Saturday, the first reading that we heard taken from the second book of Samuel regarding the sin of David, the punishment of God, and David's repentance. The narrative of the sin of David is a well-known narrative. It's been put in sake of scripture, not so much for the sin itself, because the particular sin into which David fell is all too common, unfortunately. But rather, it was put there for several other motives, one of them being that God wished to present to us a stellar example of repentance from sin. And so in the case of King David, we know, although it is not recounted in the narrative that we read today, but most particularly in uh, the beautiful psalm, Miserere, that is often recited, Have mercy on me, O God. We see there what it means, what our comportment ought to be when we reflect upon our sins. Moreover, we see the fact that sin incurs a great deal of temporal punishment. This is true also of venial sin and not simply of mortal sin. Now, in the first place, when we talk about mortal sin, namely that sin that cuts us off from the friendship of God, it is clear that we need to repent over those sins. Failure to do so results not simply in cutting ourselves off from God in this life, but also in the next. So it is clear that from those sins, minimally, we need to have repentance. But we need to repent of all of our sins. All sin incurs temporal punishment. And the punishment meted out to David in this case, even though David repented from his sin, was a rather severe punishment. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah to be your wife. I will bring evil upon you out of your own house, etc. And the child that was conceived out of wedlock was destined to die. And so there is temporal punishment, and sometimes a lot of temporal punishment, that is due for sin. Sin incurs punishment. We need to be clear on this point. Every sin incurs punishment. Why do we do penance? Why do we do voluntary penance? What's the first reason? Is it that we acknowledge our sin and we admit that we need to make up for it. We punish ourselves as it were. We are severe on ourselves and thus we call down the mercy of God. That's the whole idea behind penance, conversion. Conversion involves recognizing that there is punishment for sin and uh, that that punishment is due me and not someone else. But this presupposes something else, and this is the real point that we need to examine today. The point is this, that we need to recognize that we've sinned. Why will we ever recognize the need to do penance or the fact that there's temporal punishment that, that we may have to undergo for sin if we're not willing to acknowledge that we sinned in the first place. And so it took a prophet by the name of Nathan to convict David of his sin. David attempted at first to do a little damage control. When things didn't quite go his way, when the first sin was committed, He didn't get the message, and uh, as so often happens, and we all have experience of this, there is not a person who has not at least been tempted in this vein. We add one sin upon another because we 
Don't own up to the first sin. We're not willing to take responsibility for it. And so sin adds upon sin. And this is the story of our lives. Sin adds upon sin. Punishment adds upon punishment. All the while, we become more and more blind because that's a punishment too. Not that the blindness is therefore not culpable. It is indeed culpable. And the blindness is willful because we fail to own up, but God punishes also by allowing us to fall into a deeper darkness. And in fact, the sending of the prophet Nathan to David was a great mercy of God. Because God did not want David to persist in his blindness. And so he related to the prophet Nathan a parable to wake David up to the reality of the situation. And David uh, woke up to that reality. The scales, as it were, fell from his eyes. So we stand at first Saturday. A great grace of our Lord, a time of mercy, these first Saturdays, brought to us by Our Lady of Fatima. And what is Our Lady of Fatima trying to do? She's trying to wake us up to reality. She's trying to bring us God's mercy. She's trying to make us make that first step to acknowledge our blindness. To help us to realize, not that others have sinned, but that we have sinned. See, it's easy to point the finger at others and imagine how much punishment they ought to undergo for whatever slight sins they may have committed, all the while overlooking the very serious sins that we have committed and imagining that we'll get off scot-free. Adding sin upon sin as we seek to do damage control and Our Lady is trying to say, stop, wait a minute. Moreover, she's giving us a lifeline. What could be more beautiful than what Our Lady has proposed? What could be more wise than what our Lord has brought to us, courtesy of his own mother? Something that helps us to most perfectly recognize the gravity of our sins, but also to help us have the courage not to be weighed down by the gravity, but to turn to the one who can take the weight off our shoulders, who can give us the strength to endure whatever, te- whatever temporal punishment may be due for our sins, because we come to realize that he, our Lord, paid the full price for our sins. Whatever punishment we undergo is but a minuscule portion of what our Lord suffered for each and every one of our sins. And this gives us courage to move forward and not simply to implode in upon ourselves. That's what happens when we fall into a deeper and deeper blindness, unwilling to recognize our sin. But Our Lady comes to the rescue if we let her do so. If we let her convince us, as David allowed himself to be convinced by the prophet Nathan. And in truth, it's not as hard as we think, as we make it out to be. Certain simple practices recommended by Our Lady, not only in regard to our own souls, but in other souls as well, whom by our prayers we can touch, are very efficacious. These practices are most efficacious. These, first five, these five first Saturdays, when carried out in the true spirit, when I make a true 
honest, complete confession of sin, receive the Holy Eucharist worthily, pray the rosary, keep Our Lady company while meditating upon the mysteries of the rosary. These are very efficacious means for walking this journey from sin and blindness to redemption. Why overcomplicate the matter by coming up with a more elaborate program on our own, which, is, which would be s- simply none other than an elaborate version of our own damage control. God, God doesn't do damage control. He heals. We can't turn back the clock and affect the healing. But God, taking us here and now, can use our repentance to effect a healing, an outpouring of graces that for us would result in a condition superior to that which we might find ourselves in had we never sinned. That's why God permits us to fall into sin, so that by our repentance, by our acts of love, he can raise us to a superior condition. And it all begins with a willingness to be humble and to let God take the scales from our eyes. Only he can do this but we have to cooperate. And so let us pray to the mother of Jesus, our mother, our merciful mother, who stands before us, ready and waiting and willing to give us more than we ask for, to heal us, to bring the healing graces. Let us ask her that we may not delay to run to her. Let us ask her for the strength to bear whatever punishment God wishes, be it for our sins or maybe for some other motive best known to God, but certainly for our life. Let us pray to her that we will courageously walk that journey from beginning to end, that we may find happiness in God forever. Praise be Jesus and Mary.